wonderful time we've had in the house of the Lord, exalting the only name under heaven, given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other name, and we have lifted that name up today uh, since we arrived here this morning in prayer prior to church and through our first service. Now, I I just want to kind of clear the air here for a minute today. If I do the worst preaching you've ever heard in your life, it's okay. Because the guy that went before me today and taught, he was amazing. Now, I don't know that if you caught that or not, but that was some really good presentation. Kind of reminded me of the guy that uh, it was the bottom of the ninth. Bases were loaded. Two outs. The batting king was at the plate. There were two strikes and three balls. The last pitch of the game. The pitcher rears back. The home run guy sets and grits his teeth. He's going to knock the ball a half a mile. He's waiting. The timing is right. The pitcher hits the batter with the ball. (laughs) They win the game, but he didn't even get to bat. So that's all I'm saying about my preaching today. If If my preaching is absolutely worthless... And I get beamed with the ball. I just want y'all to know that you've had enough preaching here today uh, for this to be a winning session. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation back to Hatch Bend. And I often uh, have to reminisce about occasions and times and places. And when I do that about this beautiful church family... It was the mid-80s when we first came here as evangelists to preach. Amen. I loved being here. Uh, Our son was young. And year after year we would come and and be at this church. And yesterday when I was walking, getting a little exercise out on the road, uh, I walked by the cemetery and I thought, you know, this place is a whole lot fuller than it used to be in my lifetime, in my times of coming here. And uh, ultimately, as a pastor, you hate to see folks move from here to there. But that's what we do. That we work a lifetime to get you ready to go right over there. Amen. Because you won't be there very long. Amen. What a wonderful Wonderful place you have in the country. I'm talking about at the end of the road. The last building. Right here. But I want y'all to know you don't have to be huge as a church to be good. I look around this place. I came in here to pray. And I got to feeling all the miters on the corner of this. And I reached around down there at all that. And I can see purple. That's one color I can see. I like that. Whoever picked out purple, you did good. And I was looking around, and I just want to touch stuff. 
I just, I want my hands on it. Y'all, y'all do stuff nice. It's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, just because just you're at the end of the road don't mean you have to be backwoodsy. Amen. You folks are beautiful. And I want to thank you for being our friends for many, 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 many years. Who could forget we were in a building program then here also. In fact, y'all see that beam down the middle of this church right there? I helped put that in 35, 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, we were here helping do some uh, remodel at the church. And uh, we were outside. We were staining trim. And we had a, just opened a brand new gallon one gallon of stain, one gallon of stain, and we were painting all the trim, and uh, that day we had just got a brand new carpet on the front porch of this church, right out there, and uh, while I was painting away, I stepped inside our travel trailer, and that storm cloud came up and it started raining drops of rain big as a nickel just falling out of the heavens my son reached over and grabbed the gallon of stain because he did not want it to get water in it and he ran up the steps and tripped on the steps and spilled a gallon of stain on your brand new carpet Yesterday he texted me and said, the only thing missing in that picture on Facebook is the stain master talking about himself <laughs> wasn't in that picture. So that's why I have to keep coming back year after year to the sanctuary. I'm trying to make up for the wrongs of my son. <laughs> but I do appreciate you for giving us. Amen. What a premier ministry leadership you have at this church and I, I want to say something from my heart I want to say thank you to this church for allowing your pastor to do those things outside of this church that are beyond the call of duty that he does for the assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ and the United Pentecostal Church uh, a few months ago he and I uh, dedicated a rededicated a church together in uh, Louisville, Mississippi. Amen. Uh, thank you for letting him come. What a blessing to that church he was. He and I did a conference in Ebenezer, Mississippi together. Uh, and he could not do what he does if you weren't kind enough to allow him to do that. And I want to say thank you from my heart as an outsider for your willingness to allow your pastor to do those things beyond the boundaries of Hatch Bend Church. Thank you. God bless you. Today our thought will come basically from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and uh, verse 14. And Adam was not deceived... But the woman being deceived was in transgression. Adam was not deceived. Can you say that with me? Adam was not deceived. If we go back to creation, God created man. And God made him in his image and his likeness breathed into man the breath of life. And Adam wandered around looking. He saw all the other animals, all the other creation had mates, but he didn't have one. And uh, he began to inquire, Lord, what about a wife? So the Lord put him in a deep sleep, took his rib, he uh, gave Adam a wife from his side. Amen. He did not give Adam a wife from a foot bone so he could step on her. Neither did he give her a bone from the skull that would let her do all the thinking. But he gave him a help me. Now, Adam really liked her. 
<laughs> and life changed when Miss Adam came along. She wasn't called Eve until the transgression, but Miss Adam, you know, who Adam liked hanging out with her. Man, the days were brighter. The nights were darker. It was wonderful having that cute little wife around. Now, some of you here today are ancient of days. I can tell by the hoary head. I, I understand that. But I, I can remember far enough back, I went to camp meeting. I was a single young evangelist in love with God, sitting on the front row with my tablet. Little did I know that in that camp meeting, she was going to walk in. She probably didn't have to waddle as much as she did, but she was waddling. Blinking them eyes. Smiling. I was smitten. Adam was smitten. He liked Eve. He was... He was in love. What a, what a wonderful gift God gave him. A bride, a, a wife, someone to go with him. And they began their chores in the garden. It was naming animals and naming plants and, and doing the process that God had called them to do. And then the day came that for some reason, I don't even know where Adam was, but uh, Eve began to talk to the stranger in the garden. And there, uh, the conversation, you know, that one tree in the midst of the garden, uh, the Lord will let you eat of all of these. You know, there's nothing different about that tree. And she listened. And when she listened, it wasn't long until she had plucked the fruit from that tree and lifted it to her lips and she became in transgression of the plan and the will of God. Now, apparently Adam wasn't there to say, honey, don't do that, we're not supposed, I don't know where he was, but had he had the opportunity to put his voice in, maybe the outcome would have been different, but it wasn't long till Adam found his way back to his lover's side and uh, there on her lips is the moisture, the dew of the fruit of the garden. And Adam looks at her and says, hey, baby, what's on your lips? She said, oh, I ate of the fruit of the tree. Forbidden, but it doesn't taste bad. It's good. And you know what? I didn't fall over dead, so it's okay. Would you like a taste of the fruit? Now, Adam wasn't deceived. Miss Adam was deceived. She really thought she was doing the right thing. There's a difference in being deceived and being backslid. Folks that are deceived think they're right. Backslid folks know where to go when they get ready to come back to God because they're in the wrong place. She was deceived. Adam was not deceived. When he became a partaker of her fruit on that day, it was not that she had schemed up the story and he bought the story, but the truth of the matter is, is Adam loved her. And because of her transgression, he took her transgression up on him because he loved her. He wasn't deceived. Amen. Shall we lift our hands and love the Lord for a moment right now? I love you, Jesus. I thank you, God, for your touch, for your wonderful word that works its way into our hearts today. Lord, break up the fallow ground of our heart. Jesus, we glorify you. We love you, Lord. We believe you. 
The scripture admonishes us in Ephesians, husbands, love your wife, love her. Amen. You've got to love her. You don't have a choice. If you don't love her, you won't share what you have with her. Husbands, love your wife. Need I remind you that the church of the living God, we are sinners. We have transgressed the law of God. The law was, thou shalt have no gods before me. And we transgressed that law. We were sinners. Individually, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none of us can stand up and say, I am without sin. I am perfect. I have done the exact right thing my whole life. We are sinners. Amen. Born in sin. Shapen in iniquity. There is no good thing found within us. Our heart is deceitfully wicked. Amen. That's what we are. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you something. When the Lord of glory left his ivory palaces, condescended to the form of man, took on himself a robe of flesh, a little lower than the angels, he stepped out of heaven's glorious place. He had heard angels singing in perfect pitch for the eons of time. But he stepped down and took on the likeness of man. He came and walked dusty Judean roads. He came and looked lepers in the eye. He saw weeping widows. He saw hurting people. That God that knew that I could not go to where he was he came to me for he was without sin. He was perfect. I was born in sin. I had all the imperfections. Praise God. He came to where I was. He came to me because he loved his church. Amen. Now, I want you to know that the fall of Adam was not, it, it did not take God by surprise. God knew there was going to be that free moral agent in man, that opportunity for man to choose. There was going to be uh, that day that man would choose to love something else more than he loved God. God knew that. But the promise of God's word is this, that before man sinned, God had already placed a lamb, the scripture said in Revelation, from before the foundation of the world, God put it in place that man would have a redeemer. Praise God. God knew I was going to be worthless. He knew I was going to fall. He knew I was going to mess up. God knew that. And yet he gave me the opportunity to do that because he knew he loved me enough to cover all of my iniquities. God knew that. So God comes to earth robes himself in flesh, goes to Calvary. While on Calvary, hanging there, suspended between heaven and earth, held there by his love for his to-be bride, there, hanging, knowing that man would fall short. Knowing that man had sinned. The apostle said it like this. While I was yet 
a sinner. Christ died for me. Amen. You know, that's the thing about the spirit of adoption. You know, the Binghams are fixing to get a great grandchild. It's mama's blonde. It's daddy's dark-headed. We wonder what color the eyes will be and what it's going to look like. But you know, when you adopt a child, you get to see it before you adopt it. You know it's got teeth missing. You know its hair doesn't match the family tree. You know it stutters and you know all the bad stuff there is to know about it. And yet you go and say, I want this child to be a part of our family. Praise God. God knew what I was. God knew that I was wrong. He knew that I made mistakes. God knew that I had committed crimes against him. Yet he loved me enough that he became what I needed to fulfill my plan for God in my life. When God stepped out on the balconies of nothing and said, let there be light, and there was light, that wasn't because God needed light. That was because God knew that man was going to have the benefits of light. So before he created man, he put everything in order that man could have the opportunity to survive. So he came to the cross while hanging there. He could have called every star by name. For everything was created by him and for him. The earth that held that cross so steady had been his footstool. And yet, he saw me He saw me in my guilt. He saw me in my misery. He saw me in my faults. While hanging there, his hand stretched out. His brow was bleeding. His back was riven. There, he could have called legions of angels. But it was my love, his love for me, and his love for you that kept him in place on that cross. And he said, it is finished. No more will it be by the blood of bulls and of goats and of heifers and pigeons and turtle doves. But once and for all, There's going to be a lamb slain that was in the mind of God from before the foundation of the world. That whatever man is going to need, God is going to be the provider of that for him. The soldier came with the spear. It was customary, as the Old Testament had pre prophesied. That not a bone would be broken. It was customary for that soldier to take that spear and break the legs of the one on the cross. And the pain, if they were not dead, that pain, they would react to the pain. But when he saw that Jesus was already dead, the scripture says that he took the spear and he pierced his side. And forthwith came blood and water even as Adam's bride came from his side so the blood and the water that flowed from the side of Christ would purchase his bride also so so it was the three things that left Christ on the cross the spirit that he laid down his life 
The spirit that left him on the cross. The blood and the water that left him on the cross are the same three things that it takes for you to be a part of his bride today. He was without sin. He did no sinning. But the scripture says he became sin to take on my sin, not for his sins. When he was baptized, he wasn't baptized for the remission of his sins. He was baptized as an example to you and I that we needed to be baptized. Amen. It wasn't his sins that put him on the cross. It was my sins that separated him from his father that put on him the yoke and the ugliness of sin that he had never tasted. He took my sins upon him on that cross. Adam was not deceived. I want you to know today your salvation was not happenstance. Calvary was not a coincidence. God planned every bit of that knowing that you and I and all of our shortcomings and our failures was going to need what he had to offer for us. Amen. And the church say amen. Would you stand with me right now? I want you to lift your heart and your voice today. If you feel like you've done the unpardonable, if you feel like you've walked too far, I come to bring you good news today. I come to tell you something right now. The fact is this. He knew what you were going to be before he ever went to Calvary. He had you in mind. That's why as we gathered in this sanctuary today and called on that lovely name of Jesus and his presence swarmed into this house. His presence was made known to us. We felt him. We feel him right now. We feel that wooing. We feel that calling. We feel that beckoning. Jesus is telling us today, I love you. I know you've made mistakes, but I'm here to make you better than your mistakes. I'm here to make you walk closer to me. This altar's open today. I'm going to ask you to come. Sinner, saint, backslider, visitor, our altars are open today. Come and stand before the Lord.